Is it possible that so high debate, so sharp, so sore, and of such rate, should end so soon and was begun so late? Is it possible? Is it possible so cruel intent, so hasty heat and so soon spent, from love to hate and thenceforth to relent? Is it possible? Is it possible that any may find within one heart so diverse mind to change or turn as weather and wind? Is it possible? Is it possible to spy it in an eye that turns as oft as chance on die, the truth whereof can any try? Is it possible? It is possible for to turn so oft, to bring that lowest which was most aloft, and to fall highest, yet to light soft. It is possible. All is possible, whoso list believe, trust therefore first, and after prove, as men wed ladies, by license and leave, all is possible. To be clear, I say we owe Catherine Howard an apology in the royal sense. Referring to oneself as a collective, I am in no way obligating anyone to march down to the Tower of London right now, kneel at the altar where Catherine Howard was buried, and say sorry. For one thing, they don't just let anyone in the Chapel St Peter at Vincula, so you'd be forced to stand outside and yell sorry at the top of your lungs at the building, and the beef eaters will probably have you swiftly removed. I owe Catherine Howard an apology, and I've never known how to fully express it. Now I finally have a way because I have a YouTube channel. I know you really can't be too hard on yourself for the way you acted as a teenager, but maybe I could have watched Legally Blonde when I was 14 instead of garbage like Angus Thongs and Perfect Snogging. I was an outcast at school, and I felt as if I had to identify with the outcasts on screen who were nerdy and unpopular. And if they were girls, they would always be late bloomers with flat chests and dull brown hair and occasionally be wearing glasses. Source every Jacqueline Wilson book ever written. The rivals to these girls would always be blonde and had giant breasts and actually liked flaunting their assets. And then between 7th and 8th grade, or year 8 and 9 of school, puberty hit me like a truck. There I was, a big breasted blonde, but also an unpopular outcast. I literally did not know who I was meant to be. A lot of the worst media for teens in the late 2000s had a ton of slut shaming. Being insecure, naive and Catholic, I bought into it. And then came my Tudor history obsession. While I was disgusted that Anne Boleyn had been falsely accused of her crimes and executed, I had the misfortune of hearing only a very abridged version of the Catherine Howard story. Literally, all I heard was Anne Boleyn was executed because she was accused of adultery. Catherine Howard was executed because she did commit adultery. And my mind snapped to dubbing her as a slut almost instantly. But yeah, the view of Catherine Howard at the time was that she was a stupid slut, who got everything coming to her. In 2009, the only sympathetic media portrayal of Catherine Howard that I'd seen was Lynn Frederick, but it was overshadowed at the time by Angela Pleasance's version. Well, then along came the Tudors, and while Tamsin Merchant's version had a lot of boobs, and she was ditzy and mean at times, she was actually humanised for the first time since 1972. That quote that Natalie Dormer says, it stuck with me for days afterwards, and I began to think, okay, maybe she wasn't a slut. She wasn't very smart, but she didn't deserve to die. I've grown up a lot since then. I've gotten better at being a feminist. It's not about excluding a certain group or type you don't like, so you can climb over them and advance your cause and kick the ladder out from under you. Feminism is about all of us, beating down on fellow women just because they enjoy sex or they don't have a cervix results in nothing but narrow-minded hate. And as Gaia, Artemis, Hera and all other female deities who may or may not exist are my witness, I will never let myself become a narrow-minded person ever again if I can help it. Yes, this video is my apology to Catherine Howard. She was a victim in the wrong place at the wrong time. And misogynistic historians have bastardised the horrific things you were subjected to. In a world where we're breaking away from slut shaming and victim blaming, I'm also holding a lot of toxic elements that have been used to tread on Catherine Howard and many like her to account.
Catherine Howard's downfall, much like Anne Boleyn's, wasn't brought on because someone caught her being an unfaithful harlot and allowed the good old English justice system to take its cause. No, this fall was motivated by the Catholic Protestant schism that was running rampant throughout the court. A schism that was amplified by the fall and execution of Thomas Cromwell. Supporters on both sides found themselves either tied to a stake or disemboweled or on the chopping block. Catherine was another casualty of this schism. But I'm not sure if her death was intended by the instigator of her downfall, Thomas Cranmer. The Catholic faction headed by nobles and clergymen such as Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, and Stephen Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, were mostly in the King's favour, as they had a Howard girl on the King's arm who had the potential to give the King another son to secure the succession. They wished to see all forms of heresy eradicated, so after the King's death, which was more and more likely with each passing day, they could either influence Prince Edward to side with them or supplant him with the hypothetical heir Catherine would give him, or back the Lady Mary and make her Queen instead of Edward. Thomas Cranmer had become the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1533. He was closely allied with the Boleyn family, who were pushing for a break with Rome so Henry could annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn. His Protestantism was known in the Tudor court, as he had married a woman in Germany and had children with her. Nonetheless, Cranmer had always remained on the right side of the law to avoid arrest, and had given the King what he had wanted, even if that meant severing his connections to Cromwell and the Boleyns. John Lassells had been in the service of Thomas Cromwell. Lassells had gone silent about his Protestant leanings, but was still hoping to find employment at court. His sister Mary had served in the household of the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk at Lambeth, and knew Catherine personally from that time. When Lassells asked his sister to contact the Queen and ask her for a position on his behalf, she replied that he should not look for a place in her household. Mary had not only heard that Henry Mannix claimed he would have Catherine's maidenhead, but had also heard Francis Durham's assertions that he and Catherine were pre-contracted. To the evangelical Lassells, news that the Queen of England had engaged in immoral behaviour was a concern enough to tell Archbishop Cranmer. Cranmer interrogated Mary, and she was imprisoned for the duration of the inquest. Given that Henry VIII had requested a special sermon praising Catherine on All Hallows Day, outright telling the king might get him sent to the tower instead. Cranmer put his discoveries into a letter for Henry to find on his pew the next day. For Henry, finding a letter wouldn't be surprising as he had attended mass every day, and many would leave letters asking for favours in a place that he was most likely to find them. He would have read the letter after mass. Given what we know about Henry, we might have expected him to fly into a rage and hit something, right? Oddly enough, he didn't. He immediately believed, owing to his affection for Catherine, that the letter was made in error and someone was trying to blacken her name. He called for the Earl of Southampton and the Lord Privy Seal, William Fitzwilliam, Lord Admiral John Russell, Sir Anthony Brown and Sir Thomas Rottersley to engage in the investigation. Henry gave the orders that while the investigation into the letter's contents was underway, the Queen was to be confined to her apartments at Hampton Court and each of the maids that had lived with her at Lambeth were to be taken away for questioning. With the Queen under suspicion, it just wouldn't do to have her walk in the public through the court and be subjected to malicious gossip. Nonetheless, it would have been a stressful situation for Catherine. She quickly fell into a melancholy with the dread over what would happen to her. Given that Francis Derham was arrested soon after, his absence would have been noted. It was widely known throughout the Tudor court that you could be condemned for treason for literally anything. A slip of the tongue or an enemy looking to benefit from your downfall by taking your words out of context could be your undoing. Charles de Marillac, the French ambassador, noted that whereas before she did nothing but dance and rejoice, and now when the musicians come, they are told that it is no more time to dance. After a privy council meeting that took place at Lambeth Palace, the London residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Duke of Norfolk went to visit his stepmother nearby, where she asked him about Catherine's situation. He must have told her that she was under suspicion, because she ordered the coffers of which Derham had left behind when he went to Ireland to be opened. The contents included a note from Henry Mannix, tattling to the Dowager Duchess about Derham, which was stolen by Catherine and given to Derham for safekeeping. Others included letters from Catherine, music and poetry. Her servants were later interrogated, one of whom was Robert Damport who was tortured. These servants claimed she had gone through those documents and only put a fraction back into the coffer to be given to the Duke of Norfolk to help with the investigation. The possibility that the Dowager Duchess deliberately destroyed evidence was enough to get her arrested too. Whether she was trying to save herself or Catherine isn't clear. 
The initial belief was that Catherine and Derham were in a pre-contract, which was a promise before God that they would marry in the near future and nothing but death could invalidate it. As a result, the two of them sleeping together wouldn't be as immoral in people's eyes because they were going to get married anyway. Henry VIII was very picky about his wives, being completely untouchable before he married them. It took seven years for him to marry Catherine of Aragon because he wanted to be absolutely sure she was still a virgin. But even then, he was never satisfied with the idea. Anne Boleyn's enemies wanted to oust her by claiming she was pre-contracted to Henry Percy of Northumberland or James Butler of Ormond. But they came to little use. And so repulsed was he by Anna von Claver, he doubled down on her previous engagement to get rid of her as soon as possible. If found to be pre-contracted to Francis Derham, Catherine's marriage to the king would be invalid. She would face some shame, but she would keep her life if she cooperated with the interrogators. Catherine insisted that while she had had some sexual encounters with Derham, they were not pre-contracted to each other, though there were accounts claiming that they called each other husband and wife. She and Derham both insisted that this was part of a game. Her main inquisitor was Thomas Cranmer, who would provide accounts on his meetings with Catherine. Like Anne Boleyn, her situation made her switch violently between hysteria and depression. Cranmer is quoted as saying, At my repair unto the Queen's grace, I found her in such lamentation and heaviness, as I never saw no creature, so that it would have pitied any man's heart in the world to have looked on her. Henry delivered a message that promised Catherine mercy if she was truthful. During her confession, Catherine said, Alas, my lord, that I am alive. The fear of death grieved me not so much before, as doth now the remembrance of the king's goodness. For when I remember how gracious and loving a prince I had, I cannot but sorrow. But this sudden mercy, and more than I could have looked for, showed unto me, so unworthy at this time, maketh my offences to appear before mine eyes much more heinous than they did appear before. And the more I consider the greatness of his mercy, the more I do sorrow in my heart that I should misorder myself against his majesty. Catherine Howard was confined at Hampton Court Palace for several more days while she was being interrogated daily by Thomas Cranmer. She confessed that she and Derham had exchanged a few tokens of affection. Among them were sleeves for a shirt from Catherine and silk flowers made by a disabled woman in London from Derham. She denied the existence of a gold ring which Catherine gave Derham to look after, as this could have been taken as proof of a pre-contract. In her first confession, she claimed that her encounters with Mannix and Derham had been foolish romances. But her second confession rapidly changed to asserting that she never consented to his advances, nor did she consent to Mannix. She appealed to Henry's mercy, blaming her past on her female frailty. Another element in her first confession was a brief reference to Thomas Culpepper, as Catherine had mentioned Derham asking if she was planning to marry Culpepper before she married the king. The Inquisitors approached Derham and confirmed that Culpepper has succeeded him in her affections. Between the 7th and 14th of November, Culpepper was also arrested and taken to the Tower. Testimony from Catherine's ladies reported that during the summer progress, they were barred from entering the Queen's chambers by Lady Rochford, even until the very early hours of the morning. Culpepper's belongings were searched and the Inquisitors found a letter from Catherine that was taken as evidence that they were having an affair behind the King's back. On 14th November, Catherine was moved to Sion House, formerly Sion Abbey. Her household was dismissed, save for a handful of maids of her choosing. All her fine dresses and jewels were taken from her by Sir Thomas Seymour, and she could only take a few caps and dresses to Sion so long as they had no precious stones in them. Sion once had a reputation for being the wealthiest abbey in England, with a vast library. That was all gone now, and Sion was nothing more than a gutted, empty building, a vast decline from the luxury of Hampton Court. There was no doubt that Catherine would be executed. It seemed that Henry wasn't as eager to dispose of her as quickly as possible as he did with Anne Boleyn. Instead, the length between her arrest and execution was drawn out for several weeks. I have no doubt that the fact Francis Durham and Thomas Culpepper being condemned to death barely six weeks after the initial investigation began, was a clear demonstration of Henry's wrathful nature. Thomas Culpepper and Francis Derham were taken to Westminster Hall on 1st of December 1541, where they were put on trial. Both pleaded not guilty. Derham had the evidence drastically stacked against him, given the testimony of people from his time at Lambeth, and the speculation by the Privy Council that his motive for entering her household earlier that year was to continue their relationship. Culpepper denied any sexual relations with Catherine, 
and claimed she pined for him. They had secret meetings at Lincoln, York and Pontefract during the summer progress. However, he was reluctant, but Lady Rochford urged him into it. However, the fact that he confessed an intention to sleep with Catherine was treason in and of itself. Culpepper and Deerham changed their pleas to guilty at the last minute, in the hopes the king would be merciful. The Duke of Norfolk was said to be laughing as they were both sentenced to die the traitor's death. They were executed at Tyburn Tree on the 10th of December. It isn't clear why Culpepper's sentence was commuted, though he was from a far more aristocratic family than Deerham. There wasn't a traditional scaffold, so Culpepper was reduced to kneeling on the filthy ground as he asked the crowd to pray for him, and was dispatched. Culpepper's body was buried in what is now St. Sepulchre without Newgate. Deerham's body was hacked into quarters to be displayed as a warning against treason. One piece might have been at Lambeth, as it was tradition to display a piece of the butchered traitor in the place where their crimes were committed. This is why William Wallace's parts were displayed at places where he had opposed Edward I. There isn't much noting Catherine's activities for the next two months. She had not been formally charged with anything, but the guilt and execution of Deerham and Culpepper meant both she and Lady Rochford were guilty by association. Lady Rochford herself had to be taken to the Tower in November and suffered a nervous breakdown. With the passing of the Acts allowing the death penalty to apply to the mentally ill and making it treasonable for a Queen to conceal her past, Catherine Howard's death was inevitable. On the 10th of February, Charles Brandon, the Duke of Suffolk, headed a deputation visiting Sion Abbey to hear Catherine's defence for her actions. That same day she was removed from the Abbey and taken by barge to the Tower of London. Sources say she had to be bundled into the barge by her guards. Catherine was at the tower for a further two days before she was told on the night of the 12th by the constable of the tower, Sir John Cadgett, that she would be executed on Tower Green at 8 o'clock. Catherine's final request was to have the executioner's block brought to her so she could practice resting her head on it. Otwell Johnson reported that Catherine died well. Her exact speech to the crowd was not written down. Marillac reported that she spoke a few words saying that she merited a hundred deaths. Eustace Chapuy, the Imperial Ambassador, also noted that Catherine spoke very little and was contrite enough in her reference to Henry. Anne Boleyn was buried in an arrow chest as opposed to an actual coffin, but there is no reference if Catherine's body had the same treatment. In the Victorian era, when the graves of the chapel were reopened, they were unable to locate or identify Catherine's remains. It is likely that they completely decayed into dust if her casket wasn't sealed properly. Catherine Howard would end up posthumously, albeit indirectly, pardoned during the reign of Mary I. Yes, Bloody Mary, who was reported to not like Catherine all that much. This was because Mary did not like the idea of the act of attainder, as a lot of her supporters and friends had been subjected to it during her father and brother's reigns. She declared a mass pardon to those who had been condemned to death through attainder, as well as the families who had lost their money and station because of it. Unlike the last four queens we've looked at, every single performance that was in the rankings video features Catherine's downfall in some way, so we can actually order these from least to most accurate. Sadly, it's not a process of examining the full story because not all of them show the full story. The level of tragedy falling on this character heavily depends on how much the audience has been made to empathise with her up till now. <laughs> Fridging, for those of you who are unaware, is a trope that involves disposing of a minor character, usually female, to provide a motivation and or tragic backstory to the protagonist. Using death as motivation isn't inherently a bad thing, but the character who gets killed is sometimes objectified and doesn't have an identity beyond their death or their connection to the protagonist. As they are often killed early on in the story, they are quickly forgotten about when the main bulk of the conflict begins. The death's impact overall hinges on what they mean to the protagonist. Fridge characters include a lot of superheroes' girlfriends, including that of the crow, the pun- Telly! Oh, baby. Let me take your collar off. I'll put it back on when I'm done. Please don't purr through this. I'm gonna feed her a treat, maybe that'll keep her quiet. Telly? Problem is the treats blend in with my trousers, so it's that hard to see. Okay, that seems to have calmed her down. Fridged characters include a lot of superheroes' girlfriends, 
including that of the Crow, the Punisher, Tetley. I start telling about the Punisher and she starts purring. <laughs> Do you like the Punisher, Tetley? She really liked that Dolph Lundgren movie. And she's purring again. You just don't know how to read a room, do you, Tetley? Okay, can I continue? Including that of The Crow, The Punisher, Batman, The Green Lantern, and even Superman has lost Lois Lane in several canons. Other media examples include Tara in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Apollonia in The Godfather, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru in Star Wars, and Mira in Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance. In Young Best, there is no doubt that Catherine Howard is a fridged character. She and Anne Boleyn have the honour of the characters who get killed off as part of Elizabeth's character growth. As Anne is Elizabeth's mother, she gets posthumous development, as mother and daughter are often compared with each other, and Elizabeth gets defensive about people insulting her. Catherine's impact on the plot quickly disappears, however. This is a shame because Catherine's downfall could be used to great effect. I believe that Elizabeth's decision not to marry was made from a culmination of experiences in her childhood and adolescence, rather than one singular moment, and Catherine's must have been a truly horrific experience to Elizabeth. I'll talk about this again in part four, but I just think Catherine was underutilised in showing Elizabeth's trauma. I guess you can argue that Catherine is already fleshed out because, you know, history, but if you went into this film not knowing the history, you would forget her as quickly as the movie does. We could have benefited from one extra scene showing the two of them bonding. Otherwise, Catherine's death is only a big deal because Elizabeth is tired of her father getting rid of anyone she loves. Her only other true function is to be part of the rule of three, foreshadowing Thomas Seymour's execution. As for accuracy, since we only see the execution, I will say that one factor I didn't like was that she was in the same green dress that we met her in. I'm guessing they didn't have another dress in Dawn Adams' size? It looks as though it's happening at night, which is okay for drama, but not for history. In England, even as late as the 19th century, executions tended to take place first thing in the morning. As public affairs, people were more likely to see them and take example from them. And once again, never rest your chin on the block. If your jawbone is directly under your neck, your head won't come off in a single strike. It's very Hollywood to imagine an axe slicing off the head in a single blow, but bone is sturdier than you think. Right, I know we don't really like Joss Whedon right now, but everyone knows that if you've watched any of his shows or movies, if you're a character written by Joss Whedon, it is an unescapable fact that you are not allowed to be happy. Not once. Not even for a moment. And the same goes for Catherine Howard and Thomas Culpepper in this film. Giving them a Romeo and Juliet story only adds to the fact that these two are doomed and so is their love. Catherine's affair with Culpepper, as I previously mentioned, was built up before the marriage to Henry, but her push to become queen hindered their romance until Henry showed how fragile his ego was and he put his health in danger by trying to be a strong, gallant wrestler of his youth. Culpepper helps him to bed while Catherine comes to the realisation that marrying Henry to have all the advantages of a queen wasn't worth it, and she truly loves Culpepper. Culpepper, on the other hand, makes plans to leave court so he doesn't have to see Catherine any longer, but he is stopped at the last minute when Lady Rochford brings him to her. Henry speaks to Catherine where he vents about going to war, but he only talks about himself, always about him about his ego, so Culpepper stays to be with her and keep her happy. But no one will ever be happy. It's one of those, oh, if you could have just turned around, this would never have happened situations. But it is incredibly human. Most of the time, we don't do the smart thing. We just want to do what makes us happy in the moment. A running theme of this movie is to film the crest above the door, which in real life is meant to show when something was built. That's why when you pass old factories that have become student accommodations, they have dates like 1860 or 1917 above their doors. In the movie, it shows you what year it is in the film. Showing 1542 is obviously wrong, as the scandal erupted in 1541, and Culpepper was dead long before then. We're not sure how the court finds out about Catherine and Culpepper. Instead, we quickly cut to Lady Rochford being threatened with the rack, so she wrapped them out. Instead of featuring the arrest and Catherine's reaction to it, the downfall happens mostly off screen. Henry is told about the affair, showing him accurately breaking down in tears from it. Following that, we have one final scene with Catherine and Culpepper dancing, 
before the film cuts to a large contingent of guards marching into the palace to arrest them. The next scene is the execution, which is almost identical to Anne Boleyn's, with the same bickering couple seeing the event as entertainment and trying to get a good seat. Henry actually weeps for Catherine when he hears the guns, as opposed to his apathy at the beginning when Anne died. He is shown to be utterly alone, having exiled or killed all his previous wives. Who will have him now, and who can he trust? Good Christian people, I have been justly condemned and deserve to die. I urge you to look upon your own lives. I heard that Thomas Culpepper's actor in this is a sexy vampire in another life. I loved a sexy vampire once, and I had to watch him die. And then this series made me die on the inside. So now I'm going to make you watch as you see your sexy vampire die. And I'm going to put my anger on full blast towards Peter Morgan again and his overly sexist portrayal of Catherine. In the name of Mars, I'll chastise you! The writing of this series makes zero sense and only hinges on every character being an idiot. Which they are. At least the series is consistent on that. Like Private Life of Henry VIII, there is no Francis Durham in this. Technically. He has a cameo when he's shagging Catherine. But it's not his relationship with her that seals her fate. Culpepper, on the other hand, doesn't have a motivation to sleep with her besides horniness, I guess. Vampires are a very horny bunch. The series takes from the Six Wives of Henry VIII narrative, where Catherine has an affair to have a son because Henry can't get it up anymore. In Six Wives, she came to that conclusion on her own, out of desperation, but in this she is actively encouraged to do so by Lady Rochford and her uncle Norfolk. Okay, I can see the advantage of sleeping with another man to have a son so the king doesn't chop your head off. I'm a genius. But I think the positives might be outweighed by the negatives. The key flaw in the plan is that Henry can't shag anymore, and he knows he can't shag anymore. He actively apologised to her for it. So what do you think will happen when you tell the king you're pregnant, and he knows for a fact that you haven't been able to sleep together? You must see the problem, right? Henry has had like 12 children up to this point, four of whom survived infancy, and three are currently alive at the moment. It would not take him long to put two and two together. This was the plot of Carry On Henry, for goodness sake. The plan is doomed to fail without Catherine's utter lack of discretion. And yeah, the main problem with how the section of the series is written is that Catherine is utterly brainless, like there is no other way to put it. She is written to be this incredible dimwit who is surprised that she actually got caught. She doesn't seem to understand the danger that she's in. We the audience know, from the past two hours that we've had to endure, that Henry is not above physically hurting his wife. She must know this. Why would she literally allow a man that is not your husband into any room when you're in the bath? It's one thing if they were alone together, but like, all her ladies-in-waiting are watching. Do you know who would have been among Catherine's ladies-in-waiting who would have benefited from seeing the Howards ousted from favour? The Duchess of Suffolk, who was secretly Protestant. Perhaps Anne Stanhope, wife of Edward Seymour? There is no way a situation like this would not have reached Henry ten seconds later. In the immediate scene afterwards, you have Norfolk and Lady Rochford discussing it, saying how stupid it was, but just pointing it out does not make it good writing. If this was something that actually happened, that would be something, but you deliberately wrote this in and tried to save your ass by saying, yeah, it was stupid, I just wanted an excuse to put Emily Blunt in a bathtub and film her for half an hour. Pure, pointless, perverted male gaze. Write a character who's physically beautiful, but make her dumb as a brick so you can pretend that you're the horny vampire putting the necklace on her. And because Catherine and Culpepper are utter idiots, they literally get caught in the act. Culpepper didn't even try to be stealthy when he left her room in the middle of the night. You have to try to be that stupid. So they get caught by Cranmer, and he decides to give that letter to Henry that he finds in the chapel. Instead of it being about Catherine's past life, it's meant to be telling him that she's sleeping with Culpepper. And unlike what happened in history, Henry throws a tantrum on the spot so loud it literally makes Cranmer cringe. I don't think that was scripted, I bet the actor actually was cringing. No! Ah! Well, he needs to take a chill pill. You know what I mean? Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Standard. Cue a mishmash of scenes that leads to Catherine's execution. Culpepper is dragged out of bed. Henry bursts into Catherine's room and holds a dagger to her throat. Again, she should have known this wasn't out of character for this version of Henry. He ordered his own daughter to be dragged away from her mother. He sexually assaulted Anne Boleyn. He indirectly killed Jane Seymour. What would make you think he wouldn't physically harm you? Then the guards manhandle her out of bed to take her to the tower as well. The tower. No Scion Abbey. 
and Norfolk covers his own tracks by blaming Catherine and Lady Rochford. Oh my days, that is so two-faced. Because she's at the tower, she sees Culpepper die. And you will see Culpepper Klaus die. Everyone knows beheading a vampire is the best way to kill them. And then we have one of the worst Tudor execution scenes ever made to be shown to a mainstream audience. Remember, Twisted Tale of Bloody Mary was an independent film, so that gets off the hook just this one time. And if Catherine's memory hasn't been lacerated and trodden on enough, they couldn't even give her a dignified exit. The Tudors gave her a dignified exit, and she pissed herself in that. Despite Catherine saying in the previous scene that she was glad to die soon so she could be with Culpepper, she gets upon the scaffold with reluctance, refuses to stand up straight while she gives her speech, sobs all the way through it, and then at the very end has to be restrained and held down on the block as she screams to the heavens, I don't want to die! That is so random. <laughs> you must be very traumatised. Do you know what I mean? It sums up everything that is wrong with this series and has absolutely no credible resemblance to anything that happened in real life. If the world owes Catherine Howard an apology, Peter Morgan must be the first in line to give contrition and he should be banned from writing women for all eternity. You did her dirty just to satisfy your own sick fetishes. That is beyond disrespectful. which I have committed against the most high God and a kind prince. At last, I've been wanting to talk about a certain element of this episode that is addressed in the sequel to Six Wives of Henry VIII, and it does add to my point that the impact of Catherine Howard's downfall needs to traumatise Elizabeth. For a series that is pretty accurate about the events surrounding the wives, this episode used dramatic license the most. Because dramatically it does work, but I can tell that the narrative decision was made in order to create a more streamlined story and to save on their budget. That's why we don't see the summer progress of 1541 or any exterior shots. Most of the episode takes place in Henry's apartments, Catherine's bedchamber or the Dowager Duchess's house. Francis Deerham has popped up in the court and has already started dropping hints about his relationship with her. With a son, Catherine is untouchable. However, Henry can't get it up. So if she did get pregnant, it wouldn't fix anything. It would in fact make things worse, unless Henry's pride forces him to pretend that the baby is his. Catherine chooses Thomas Culpepper sort of on a whim. He admires her and she likes to be admired. Despite sleeping together for seemingly months, Catherine returns from the summer progress still not pregnant. The Duke of Norfolk is anxious. He knows about the affair but has kept his distance so he can save his own neck if she is ever found out. According to him, Catherine is being less and less discreet about it too. And then he finds out that Thomas Cranmer, who doesn't appear in this episode, is investigating Catherine. Norfolk realises that to save his own skin he has to go to Henry now and tell him about Culpepper. He sells Catherine down the river without a second thought and is also the one to arrest her. This scene here had the potential to be really scary and dramatic, as all of a sudden the walls are closing in around her. But all I can do is cringe. It comes down to the acting, really. Angela Pleasance really hams up her performance, to the point where all you see is an actor putting on a face. I burst out laughing every single time Sheila Burrell's Lady Rochford just starts shrieking. The scene is so quiet and then suddenly... Then Catherine Howard runs to another door and screams her head off at the sight of pikes in front of her. That's your haunted gallery. You couldn't afford a corridor. And to top it all off, the yeoman on one side wasn't cropped out so you can see his extra smirk at the guy opposite him. And that takes you out of the scene even more because that's probably like the eighth take they've done and he's just smirking because he finds it hilarious. The biggest problem I have with this scene is that it's inconsistent with what we hear in Elizabeth R. Twice in the sequel series, we hear from Elizabeth that it was Catherine Howard being dragged down the gallery from Hampton Court, trying to get to Henry, that taught her never to trust men. She tells William Cecil and Robert Dudley how this affected her. I have trusted no man since the day when I was eight. You have forgotten what happened when I was eight years old. Catherine Howard. And Queen Catherine Howard ran screaming along the galleries of the palace to plead with the great Henry. But they wouldn't let her speak to him. He was her husband, but they wouldn't let her speak to him. First there is trust, then passion, then death. You and I have both known what it is to have an axe fall very close to our own head. But the scene she refers to is simply Catherine standing in her bedchamber and screaming at the top of her lungs. 
Glenda Jackson described the experience with real emotion, as if young Elizabeth has been devastatingly traumatised from how easily a queen can go from on top of the world to a scaffold. Yet every time you just remember this endless screaming that's too theatrical to take seriously. The episode crawls to an end. Catherine is at Sion Abbey and breaks the fourth wall as she practices her execution. It should have been a really solemn moment, but I can never stop looking at my phone in this scene. We don't see Catherine die. We leave her practicing and fade to Henry. You might as well leave on the best actor of the series who portrays Henry remarkably keeping some restraint on his anger. He is so furious that a glimpse of his rage surfaces as he banishes Norfolk from court. It's not Catherine he blames for this ordeal, it's her scheming uncle who has served two nieces to him on a silver platter and capitalised on their deaths. For your own special safety, you would do well to stay in the north. You are the source of corruption, Norfolk. You are the disease. If I do speak, it will be to condemn you. If I do see you, I will look only on your head! He orders his surgeons to drain the ulcer up but not hold back. He will feel nothing. Obviously this is not the best episode. It's one of those things where you peel under the surface and uncover how bare bones everything is. And Catherine is only written enough for her motivations to make sense, even if she clearly did not think the plan through. The story is very streamlined, so someone comes in not knowing the history would suppose this is what happened. It's disingenuous considering the other episodes are so accurate. I'm glad we're not going to be seeing this episode again, at least not for a while. There's nothing more to it. He just cares so much, he's devoted. He says we have a connection. Catherine Howard's downfall in Six pretty much only takes up the final chorus and the first line of dialogue afterwards. And then I was beheaded. <laughs> wow, that got pretty real just then. As I said back in the rankings, the confident and provocative tone the song had is now juxtaposed with Catherine struggling to break free of the hands on her that won't let go. She is distressed and her final chorus has her despair as she realises every man in her life has used her for their own ends and don't even care about pleasing her sexually. They won't keep their hands off her, even when she says no. This version goes to show how our view of Catherine has changed, especially when it comes to her relationship with Thomas Culpepper. Gradually, we've gone from thinking theirs was a forbidden Romeo and Juliet story, to blaming Catherine for being reckless, to realising Culpepper was actually kind of a douche. It takes a bit of analysis to realise Culpepper is another villain, but really nice guy should be enough of an indicator in this day and age. It's very likely in real life that Culpepper nice guyed his way into taking advantage of Catherine, believing he was owed her after being there for her, that their relationship was transactional, he should get something in return for doing the bare bloody minimum. In recent years, we've come to realise just how sickening that mindset is. The only reason to be nice is to get something out of it in return. That men are somehow owed sex because they smiled at a woman and didn't immediately call her a bitch to her face. The whole point of being kind is being selfless. That you're not supposed to expect anything in return. And you're doing it because you know it's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, Catherine learned the hard way that when you're pretty, young and feminine, there are a lot of men with authority who will offer you something seemingly out of goodwill, but will always want something in return and will make you suffer if they don't get it. You saw glimpses of this in the Tudors, but it's been fully realised now, especially by historians like Lucy Worsley and Gareth Russell, that if any sexual intercourse happened between Culpepper and Catherine Howard, it likely was a result of him blackmailing her and leaving her in an unwinnable situation where she would be dooming herself if she spoke up. The best case scenario was that she didn't know he was taking advantage of her and genuinely believed she was in love with him. The truth is, we'll never know the full story, but the evidence of Culpepper already committing sexual assault on another woman, not long beforehand, supports the idea that Culpepper abused Catherine. He didn't care about the consequences. Many sexual predators don't think their actions will come back to haunt them. After the song, you have Catherine's defensive humour about her trauma becoming more aggressive. She proclaims herself the winner, while the others try to invalidate her by saying her song wasn't as heart-wrenching or that she wasn't the only one who was manipulated by men, but she doesn't take any of their barbs and points out that she had four choruses in her song, that's how much she had to deal with. Obviously, due to the conventions of the musical, you neither see the arrest nor the execution, and there isn't even a mention of Lady Rochford. But the chaos of the final chorus mirrors Catherine's own emotional despair as her death neared, and the final lines become calmer. As you can imagine, this represents her standing on the scaffold awaiting death. The last words are, the only thing you want to do is... 
The kiss sound can represent the axe falling, and the ah uh, is Catherine's last breath. You feel haunted by this song. It's a raw emotional dive into what happened to Catherine from her perspective. It will leave you feeling unclean and give you a new perception of her. I have come here to die. I like that a whole episode of this series is dedicated to Catherine's downfall. And most of it is pretty great, except for this one moment towards the end, but we'll get to that. The reason for the Culpepper affair in this series is that Catherine is lonely and Culpepper is an opportunist, feeling entitled to Catherine's body. They seem to be concealing their secret well enough, but the appearance of Francis Durham in the previous episode is what brings everything crashing down. Do you know what this episode needed? Elizabeth. Seriously, the first scene of the next episode has Elizabeth swearing that she will never marry because of what happened to Catherine, and Mary is like, yeah, I get that. But imagine if Elizabeth had been there to witness the events. That would have made this opening scene carry more impact. The events of Catherine's downfall are followed rather accurately. I think it would have been so easy to write a caught-in-the-act narrative, but no, it sticks to the events of the scandal erupting because of Durham, and unintentionally leading into discovering what's been happening with Culpepper. The inaccuracies are the lack of Thomas Cranmer and the Duke of Norfolk, who were key figures in the investigation. The letter that originally came from Cranmer is made a subject of mystery. We never find out who wrote it, which gives Henry all the more reason to suppose that it's just slander. Due to the Tudors' constant compositing of characters, it means that the investigating is divided among Bishop Gardiner, Edward and Thomas Seymour, Richard Rich and Charles Brandon. That's fair enough, because these are the characters we are most familiar with. Edward Seymour and Charles Brandon were both complicit in putting Catherine in front of the King, so they have to cover their asses by throwing as many people under the bus as possible. Although Henry is aware of this, he won't touch his precious husband Charles, as long as he delivers what he wants. Charles. Majesty. This is the only version to feature the story we recognise so well with Catherine, where she runs frantically to try and get to the king, only to be dragged back. It's a testament to J.R.M.'s acting that he just stares at her and walks away, followed by Culpepper following him as if he doesn't know her. The whole court sees her being dragged away, including Eustace Chapuis, but I really think we needed more characters there. We needed Elizabeth to see this. Yes, we need to traumatise a child, have Brandon witness it too, maybe Lady Mary. Come on, I need more character reactions, not just Eustace Chapuis. I know he's a very important character, but I just need more people to react to that. I like that for the past several episodes, we have seen Catherine showered in jewels and wearing vibrant, intricately made dresses and being the object of praise and free to do whatever she wants. By the end of the episode, all of that is gone. Her hair becomes loose and unkempt. She is reduced to wearing a plain black dress, which she also gets executed in, and all of her jewellery has been taken away. Underneath all of that is a frightened girl alone in the world. This is the only version that shows Culpepper and Deerham getting executed, interspersed with the scene of clips of Catherine dancing. I like those montages where the music is uplifting or peaceful, but the music is contrasted with images of carnage. Catherine has also loved to dance, and in the depressing circumstances she's in, this is the only way to stop her losing her mind. Like in history, she is dragged from Sion and sees Culpepper and Deerham's heads on spikes which were clearly deliberately placed for her to see, and truth to life, she asks for the block. Why she practices the execution naked, I don't know. There is literally no point. My guess is Tamsin had one more nude scene requirement in her contract, and no one else knew where to put it. The set they chose for the site of Catherine's execution is the same as the one used for Culpepper and Deerham. You can use all the fancy words you want to explain having a larger looking crowd to react in disgust at seeing a young girl die, but it was clearly a case of we don't want or have the budget for another set. Keep in mind, for a series that had a lot of execution scenes in the last three seasons, this is the only episode in the fourth season that actually shows any beheadings. We get a burning later on, but a different set is used for that. The scene has a good atmosphere though, as people are less bloodthirsty to see this one as they were for Derham and Culpepper's, somewhat in a mournful respect for the death of a queen. There is no music played in this scene, you just have the ambience of the crowd. In this version, Lady Rochford is the first to die. I can understand this being done for dramatic license. They want to end the episode with Catherine's death, but Lady Rochford has been a well-established character since season two, so it's only right that she's given a proper send-off. 
Catherine is met on the scaffold with some of those who helped boost her up to be a queen and were quick to abandon her. Because there is no Duke of Norfolk, having the Earl of Surrey there to look at her as if she's a stranger is enough to show even the Howards have abandoned her. She doesn't take her eyes off the axe as she sees Lady Rochford beheaded, while you see Edward Seymour look away. Don't worry, Ned. That will be you in ten years' time. Knowing this is the end, Catherine sees Joan Bulmer, who somehow got off scot-free despite actively abetting in the affair. It does show Catherine pissed herself having seen it, but no one notices, and she refuses to let her fear show. She looks up and sees the new moon still in the sky, a symbol for a new beginning. It wouldn't be usual for someone to be executed while the previous victim's blood is still wet on the block, but this episode is all about the artsy symbolism and keeps rolling with it. I kind of feel the slow pace of this scene is putting you in Catherine's head, just painstakingly savouring the last few seconds of life before the end. And the speech. It's the wrong speech historically, but for this Catherine in particular, I imagine she is finally seizing control for once in her life, declaring, I am already dead. You can't hurt me. There is no one left that I love. Thomas Rottersley and Edward Bainton share glances that are mirrored by the Seymour brothers. Disapproval, judgement, knowing the King's not going to be happy when he hears what Catherine's last words were. But Joan Bulmer smiles through her tears, glad at least that Catherine stayed true to herself until the end. The final shot cuts out with a fly in the frame, and Catherine drawing her last breath before the axe falls. Lord help me, I cannot hate this. I'm not sorry for placing Lynn Frederick second on the rankings, but consider her version of Catherine's downfall being the most accurate as your consolation. I'm going to talk some more about Lynn Frederick's sad life at a later date. She was unfairly treated in her career, which is a real shame because she was a great actress. The events of Catherine's downfall pass by quickly, but somehow the pacing doesn't feel rushed. I guess it's because enough time is given to the downfall and the acting is good enough, so you leave satisfied, albeit wanting more. If you didn't know the history, you'd have to pay close attention to the dialogue to understand it. As the narrative is told primarily through the bias of Henry as he remembers Catherine in his last moments, you can forgive the lack of details and see the events as he perceived them. In this version, we don't know about the Culpepper affair until Henry does. We share in the revelation and his grief in condemning Catherine to death. If you're paying attention during the film, you see Culpepper and Catherine sharing a glance in the summer progress scene. A small glimpse you might miss. Henry misses it. He sees them walking together in the gardens and thinks nothing of it. His two favourite people are just strolling, as far as he's concerned. His dutiful servant is just letting his darling wife know how he's faring. Because he's Henry VIII and it's always about him. Catherine's reasons for the affair are obscure. From what I gathered during the scene with Cranmer, she had her heart set on marrying Culpepper before Norfolk Gardner and her grandmother insisted she marry the king instead. Other than that, we know nothing. I can forgive having no haunted gallery scene because of the tone the filmmakers were clearly trying to set. They could have done it in the scene where Catherine tries to leave her apartments and the guards block her way and end with her being dragged off, but it would have felt too repetitive to then cut to the scene with Cranmer which also ends with Catherine emotionally despairing at her fate. Besides, the latter scene has grown on me quite a bit. Consider this story is told through Henry's perspective. Obviously, he wasn't there when she was being interrogated. This is what Cranmer told him after the fact, or what he gleaned from her written testimony. The way the silence of the scene quickly swells with the chaotic music from Anne Boleyn's mask earlier in the film can be read both ways. To Catherine, it's her thinking about Anne's death and how brave she was when she met her death terrified of her own. To Henry, having another wife supposedly cheat on him reminds him of the rage and passion he felt, as well as the dread when he got rid of Anne. I want to save Cranmer's reaction for a potential rankings list. For now, I'll just say his reticence is his knowing there is no saving her. The execution is really good. In my opinion, with some death scenes, less is more. There are some, like Catherine Howard, who went out with a whisper, not a shout. The lack of dialogue and the background score only being drum beats sets the mood perfectly. Catherine is silent, but she shakes, as if willing herself to be brave just a little bit longer. We don't hear the cannon going off to announce her death. Instead, we cut from Catherine giving the signal for the executioner to strike, followed immediately by Henry's falcon being startled by the cannon shot. Henry says nothing, pondering another lost wife. 
Talking about the tragic death of a teenager hardly seems like a healthy alternative to talking about the Titanic. Either way, I'm talking about people who tragically died before their time. But that's history for you. No one ever said it was perfect. Anyone who says differently is selling something. The cruelty towards those who are abused and then victim blamed and punished is something that still persists today. Catherine Howard was a casualty of this cruel system. It is a malignant truth that people knew about but didn't want to acknowledge. Of course, I'm not done with Catherine Howard yet because there is so much more I need to talk about. So when I can get round to finishing the next script, we'll talk about the elements and prejudices that have caused Catherine Howard to be misunderstood and unfairly judged. I hope you're up for that. As for now, I'm going to work on some Titanic rankings and repeatedly use this meme every time I feel smarter than professionals. If you think that's bad, you should see me with Richard Osman's House of Games. One thing you need to know about me is I always have to be right, but I have to be incontrovertibly right. So that's why I will never advocate for conspiracy theories or claims of hoaxes. I will always try to find sources and reliable grounds on which to make my arguments, because if there is one thing I can't stand, it's willful ignorance. Another word for that is lying. And I hate liars. Like Henry VIII. I don't like Henry VIII. I'm rambling now. So I'm going to wrap up here and start thanking my patrons who are so good to me. Remember guys, you can support the channel by becoming a patron, but that is completely optional. But even the minimum contribution can get your names in the credits. You can also get a shout out in the credits, like Anastasia Gracia, Alison Cuff and Larissa here, if you'd pledge the highest tier per video. Other than that, please make sure you keep this channel going by liking it, sharing and subscribing. I'm doing more dresser work throughout May in the theatre of which is in a different city, so I don't know how much time that's going to take from me because it did take a lot of time from me when I was doing the Pearl Harbor rankings, so we'll just see what happens. This is why I'm trying to release things in smaller doses.